So let me tell you why I'm in love with Madame Lavoisier. Uh, she, she lived 225 years ago. She died in 1836, so that's 170 years ago. Uh, but she's very much alive for me. So she was born as uh, Marie-Anne Pierre Pauls. She was the daughter of a tax collector, a banker, under the old French royal regime. Uh, and she married when she was very young. When she was 13, she came out of the convent school where she was being trained, not to be a nun, but that is what uh, young women, uh, where, th where they went to school. And she came back to uh, keep house for her father when his uh, wife died. Uh, she was a hostess. Uh, she learned all the skills when she was young. And at that point, she attracted the attention of a count who was a mere 50 years older. There's a wonderful letter at Cornell in the library uh, which uh, has her father rejecting that advance. Another suitor was uh, much more welcome. This was Monsieur Lavoisier, only 15 years older, and she married him at age 13. I would like to show you what we have of her through her artwork, which was very important to her. As you see, it was very important also to Lavoisier, and uh, she was trained for it with a great French painter, uh, Jacques-Louis David. Here is a, the first surviving piece of work that we have by her. It's a self-portrait. She went on to study also English. She learned chemistry, physics, and mathematics to help her husband. She ran a salon for him. And she did the illustrations for the books that he wrote. Now, a little bit about Antoine Laurent La Lavoisier himself. Here's a portrait of him uh, later in life, uh, not at the time they got married. He was a scientist, a geologist, a chemist, a ph physicist, and biologist, but he was also a banker and an economist under the king. Uh, what he took a most active part in was something called the La Femme Générale, the General Farm. This was a a realization of what today would be called the Republicans' fondest dreams, which is to privatize everything in sight. Uh, the Internal Revenue Service privatized. Imagine that. That's what the Ferme Generale was. It was a private firm that collected the taxes for the king. And he bought a share in it. Uh, Marie Anne's father was one of the directors of it. You can understand that. Uh, then when the French Revolution came about, uh, those were not very popular people. And that's why they were executed in, on May 8, 1794. Lavoisier was a great scientist. He also took part in many other things. He debunked mesmerism. He made judgments about which kind of system for flying balloons. Balloonery was in the air. He smuggled gunpowder to the Americans. Um, he did a great variety of things. She kept a salon for him, and she also helped him in the laboratory. Here is a wonderful portrait that they commissioned David, who was her teacher, to paint of them. Uh, they paid for this the equivalent today of about $200,000. They were very rich. Uh, in a sense, what Lavoisier had was a his own system of supporting his research. He just took some money from the taxes they collected from the people. In this painting, there is a summary of the two worlds they moved in. You see at the left uh, an easel uh, that shows her artwork. Uh, and then at the right, meticulously detailed are various scientific instruments that Lavoisier used in his research. It's a typical David painting, strongly composed. You see this incredible diagonal formed by her hand and the, the rather weird positioning of uh, Monsieur Lavoisier's leg coming out on the table, and then David showing off by, pointing, by painting the glass vessel over at lower right. But really, what's interesting about this is the psychology. I mean, look at this. Uh, here is this woman, and it is true she is affectionately leaning on Lavoisier's shoulder, but she's also leaning into his sphere of influence. 
and he's partially in her shadow and he's looking not at us he's looking at her and she's looking out at us I think there's something captured here about the psychology of the interaction of these two people at Cornell libraries have the most incredible things we have not only the illustrations that she did for his great treatise, elementary treatise of chemistry, which came out in the year of the fall of the Bastille. But we have even the copper plates that she engraved. She did not only the drawings but, and the paintings, some of which I'll show you, but she did also the actual etching of these. So what we have are things like the preparatory watercolors that she did, that you see here, in preparation for the 13 plates of the elementary treatise of chemistry. And then we have various stages or proofs of the, of the engravings, the plates. Uh, you notice here, for instance, that she has done the engraving with the figures, and I've picked this one out because it has the same figures that you saw in a previous one, that little table up at the upper left and the filters that you see at the right. But then she has done the engraving, and now the next stage she's written by hand certain numbers to be put on in the next stage of the engraving of the plate. And she has written at lower right, Bon. She has approved it. It's good enough to go on. Here's perhaps the most touching of these uh, plates. Uh, again, an intermediate stage. The engraving of the vessels has been done. Uh, there is a burning lens which figures in our play at lower left. She's put on the various labels on this. But she wasn't happy with the way something came out in a painting of a little kind of spoon-like depression dish. And so she has redrawn that on a separate piece of paper, and she has pinned it to the original with uh, a real pit. This is an 18th century post-it note. And it's also done by her hand. So when you see this, you, you're, you have the feeling of process, but you also see the hand of the artist at work. You also see, if you look at lower right, it's n it wasn't very easy to get a quill pen to work, so there are little hen-like scratches, which is the quill pen trying to get the quill pen to write on this. It's very much a human document that is here. Then there are two ink washes, which are remarkable representations in a number of ways. Very carefully composed uh, and also uh, the first representations of women in a scientific laboratory in the history of humanity. These are two representations. Here's the first one of the experiments that Lavoisier did on respiration. And what you see is the people working on the experiment but then you also see at the right Madame Lavoisier, and she is sitting there and, in this case, recording the readings that they are calling out. She did much more than that. Uh, those experiments were done between 5 and 9 in the morning in her laboratory. The rest of the time he was in his duties as a banker. And uh, she drew up the protocols, that is, the order of the experiments, the, what equipment was needed, what was to be studied every day, that survives in her hand. The composition is very strong. Look at the, there is a constrained shape here. All the people are standing here. Lavoisier is standing with his back to us. Uh, the people are standing, they're pointing away to the right. And at the right is sitting Madame Lavoisier, again recording the notes, it was rather cold in the laboratory in the morning. She's taken off her cloak. It's gotten a little bit warmer, and she's looking back. There's a little bit of tension. Uh, perhaps they're pointing to her in some way. I don't know exactly. Uh, one of the interesting things, the perspectives done on this tile floor, uh, the vanishing point in this perspective drawing is exactly at Lavoisier's heart. This is a portrait by Madame Lavoisier of a person who's recognizable to Americans. It's Benjamin Franklin, who was a friend of the family, uh, very much uh, 
in correspondence with, and known to these people. Uh, this portrait was painted around the early 1780s, and it's just been rediscovered after having been lost, in quotation marks, for a mere 220 years. We knew of its existence because the uh, Franklin correspondence is, is very well edited, and he wrote to them several times. He thanked her for the painting when he got it, and then it got captured when the British captured some place where Franklin had lived in a sequel uh, to the war um, and to the Revolutionary War. And he writes to her that it was recovered, and he was glad because it was his favorite painting. I come back to this representation of the two of them by Jacques-Louis David. Um, and the question of, was Marianne a chemist? She had the training to be the chemist, and you see in her own paintings what she did in the laboratory. It was actually a time for women in certain circles in France. Aside from Marianne Lavoisier, there was the remarkable figure of Emily de Breteuil, the Marquise de Châtelet, uh, who 50 years before was the first to translate Newton into French. If you've ever tried to read Newton in English, uh, you will know it's not very easy. Uh, Madame de Châtelet studied mathematics and physics. She was Voltaire's lover for a number of years, uh, a, a very interesting person. Sophie Germain, a, ma a mathematician, wrote to Gauss and to several other mathematicians, corresponded with them, using her initials so they wouldn't be prejudiced because she was a woman. Madame Picardet translated together with Madame Lavoisier, a book by Kerwin about phlogiston into French. She also worked for another um, French chemist, Guy de Morveau. For women in certain aristocratic circles, private instruction in science was possible and even work in laboratories. But when I see this picture, I'm, I'm a little sad. Actually, Marie-Anne Pierrette Pauls de Lavoisier had a lot of opportunities. She moved in a circle of scientists, uh, unlike uh, Madame Chatel du Châtelet, whom I uh, mentioned, who was fairly isolated. M Madame Lavoisier, aside from running a salon, did experiments. She worked together with some scientists. And the sad thing is that she was not recognized for this by the very people who knew her best, including her husband.